During the Middle Ages, there were many advances socially, politically, and economically. Some things that impact the Middle Ages and the people of that era are their hobbies, attire, royal life, and the wars and battles that shaped their society. If we had no records of their lifestyle, then we wouldn't have any real record of their existence and their culture, which would prevent us from learning about them and about their culture. Life in the village shaped the people of the Middle Ages and how they conducted them themselves. One topic that was very important to them was entertainment and other pastimes. Some forms of sports that were played was a form of soccer by kicking a large ball. Wrestling, pitching clouts, which was an early version of horseshoes where players would throw a metal ring or rubber ring over a pole. Archery, fighting with cudgets or clubs, a form of badminton with balls and paddles, and ice skating where people would strap the shin bones and calves to their feet and skate on frozen water. Other forms of entertainment that people took part in were hunting, athletic tournaments like wrestling and man versus man, dancing, chess, hawking, in which where people would take pigeons, herons, waterfall, rabbit, and other small game and then give them to hawks to be eaten, drinking, gambling, and backgammon, storytelling, and most importantly, feasting were all other things that they liked. Feasts, festivals and holidays were very important to the people within the medieval villages. These special days were comprised of singing, dancing, and a great abundance of food. Religious ceremonies like Easter and All Saints Day were also celebrated. For Easter, the people would celebrate the green man dressed in green branches and would dance through the streets. This green man was said to represent regrowth or rebirth. On All Saints Day, they would honor the saints like Joan of Arc, Joan of Arc Thomas Beckett, and the Ven Venerable Be Bede. The month of May also held a great significance for the people because it signaled the beginning of spring and the dancing around the maypole. This is when people would dance the Morris dance around the maypole, which is a pole painted and decorated with the, with flowers. People would dance on the would dance on May Day while holding long ribbons attached to the top of the pole. People also attended church regularly. For the poor, a church was one of the only places one could experience and appreciate beautiful architecture. Another aspect of medieval life that greatly impacted people, especially royalty, was attire, and in this case, royal attire. In the 100s, women wore dresses called leos. These were flowy gowns with long sleeves that brushed the floor. They also had long hair that would touch the ground, and, only, and if one didn't have long hair, then they would wear extensions. Women also wore headdresses like veils for religious reasons. For the most part, only women who were married wore wimples, which was a cloth headdress that covered a woman's neck and shoulders. They were worn over a hood or filet and barbette, which would strap around the head and the chin to keep the wimples in place. A circlet or band could also be worn over the wimple. Men wore long tunics with tight sleeves and long hair and a ponytail. When the 1200s came along, the fashion of women and men changed. Women wore dresses that were long and simple. These dresses were called kirtles. Surcoats were worn over the kirtles. Surcoats were, wore, were loose and sleeves, sleeveless with deep sides. Women continued to wear filets and barbettes with veils sometimes worn in the back. They also wore decorative hairnets called cows or crispinets with two big buns on each side. Men also wore kirtles and surcoats as well, but sometimes with a belt. Men also wore hats or hoods known as crops, which resembled that of a swim cap.
During the 1300s, the style of women and men changed drastically. Buttons were invented, which allowed clothing to be made more form-fitting, and the status of a person was affected by how many buttons one wore. Women's dresses transformed to fitted dresses from being loose and flowy. Dresses divide, dividing into colors, two colors, or a mi parti, were also worn. Men wore clothes that were fitted as well. Tunics became shorter and puffy sleeves and buttons were worn in the front. Men also started to wear hose or tights made of wool or silk and wore shoes called poulangs with long pointed toes. Women wore their hair in rectangular braids at the front of the head with circlets around them. Men wore lyrikis, which were hoods with long pointless tails. During the 1400s, fashion became abstractly extravagant. Women wore ex an external garment called the hoopalan, which was an enormous trench, which was like an enormous trench coat with big sleeves that could be accented with dagging or fur. The invention of the collar also became popular, along with V-necks and high waistlines. Men wore hoopalans and as well as hukes, which was a which was a loose and flowy tunic that were pulled that was pulled over the head. Men also wore large hats with fabric that would hang and rest on the neck, while women wore bralettes, which looked similar to horns. Women would also wear hennets, which were large headdresses that with fabric draping around them. These headdresses could be shaped in Cylinders, cones, or in this case, the butterfly style. Besides having beautiful and lavish clothing, royalty also had access to big castles and moats. These moats provided protection for them and others within the village during a time of crisis. Castles were built as a protection rather than beauty and luxury. They were also built to house livestock. Most castles were constructed on cliffs or near a river, where a surrounding area could be viewed. The castle was made of a wooden structure with a mound of dirt underneath it. If there was flat land surrounding the castle, then a moat was built. A moat is a deep, wide ditch surrounding a castle, fort, or town, typically filled with water and intended as a defense against the attack. The moat was that it built, was that built, the moat that was built had big, a big wooden fence surrounding it with a bailey or free space between it and the castle. As time progressed, the wooden fence surrounding the moat had added battle par parapets built on, had battle parapets built on it. Then a dungeon or masonry keep was built within the bailey. The dungeons used to be rectangular, but it was later discovered that a round dungeon would be easier to defend. There were pr private apartments and well within the castle, well within the castle to provide people with shelter and water during times of need. Although the Middle Ages brought us glamorous fashion, entertaining activities, and enormous castles. There were also awful battles that erupted. Although the feud between England and France carried on for over a hundred years, it did bring some advantages. It advanced weaponry in both England and France and showed the competitive nature of both sides. This war, the Hundred Years' War, also started the Battle of the Roses in England. The Hundred Years' War was a war between England and France that lasted from 1337 to 1453. During this time period, power shifted from feudal lords to monarchs and the common people. It started when Edward III married a French princess and claimed that the French throne was his, and a feud broke out. Another reason for war was a fight over control of the English Channel. In the beginning of the war, England had a good amount of victories. One reason for their victories was the invention of the longbow. A longbow was a bow that could shoot three arrows at once and was faster than France's crossbow, 
the spell will later not come in, will later be useless against the cannon. At this point, it seemed as though the English could win control over France. At the Battle of Sluys, English won, England won the control of the English Channel, which was then followed by the Battle of Crecy and the Battle of Poitiers. In 1360, King John of France signed the Treaty of Calais, which signed over the Duchy of Genuine, Guyenne, to save his title and give England complete control over the Duchy of Guyenne. However, in, thir in 1380, the land was gained back through a series of sieges. Charles V, King John's son, and his commander-in-chief, Ferdinand de Gus Gus Gusclion, um, led the sieges, but all that battling ceased when the Black Plague erupted. Later on, King Henry V of Wink England won at the Eugene Court in 1415 and conquered Normandy in, in 1417 and tried to become king of France through the Treaty of Troyes in 1420. The French refused to be taken over, so in the end, King Henry did not become king. As years went on, new obstacles formed. In 1429, Joan of Arc was lifted the siege of New Orleans and freed Paris and the Ile de France from 14 from 1436 to 1441 and in 1445 to 1448 the french army reformed two years later charles the 7th recaptured the duchy of normandy at the battle of formigny and seized guyenne in 1453 at the battle of castillon as the war began to end the english knew that the french troops were too strong to be directly confronted so the feud came to a close.